our speaker today is Bert van der <laughs> Sorry, I, I really tried my best <laughs> to, to, to tell you well, but I knew I failed, I would fail. Uh, he studied physics and astronomy at Ghent University in 2019, did his master thesis at the XML Newton Science Operations Center in ESAC, Madrid. Uh, in 2020, he won the Ugen Arman PM Prize uh, for best master thesis in physics and astronomy uh, in 2020. Also, uh, he was awarded a quite prestigious FWO PhD fellowship and started he, his PhD uh, with Professor Martin Weiss and Professor Marco Staleski. Uh, he's currently a scare developer uh, from already three years ago. Uh, his research is focused on X-ray gravity transfer uh, in agent. Indeed, indeed, his uh, thesis is focused on his, in extending the scare code to X-ray regime. Uh, our agent work is working on a code uh, at mini travel, so uh, we are we, we are uh, willing to extend uh, our research to X-ray. So for what for us it was a, a real good perfect match for our group. This is why uh, when I met him uh, last uh, December, I decided to invite him to come. Uh, as you might know, he's currently giving us a workshop on the scare. Started last Tuesday until next Monday. You can jo join us if you want. And uh, um, he's in office 203, and he uh, he will be around until uh, midday Thursday. So if you want to pass by his office and discuss. It. Okay, um, thanks a lot for having me. And um, so I'm Bert van der Meulen uh, from Ghent University. And I would like to present the latest X-ray functionalities of the skirt rated transfer code with uh, applications in obscured AGM. So nowadays we assume that all massive galaxies contain a supermassive black hole at their center with a mass between a million and a billion solar masses. And when these supermassive black holes are actively creating gas and dust from their surroundings, they become very bright. And these bright, compact center regions of massive galaxies is what we call active galactic nuclei, or AGM abbreviated. So in general, there's a wide variety of HN types that is being observed. And we can explain this variety according to the HN unification scheme by assuming a torus, a, a large scale structure of gas and dust around the supermassive black hole. And then um, this torus provides obscured and unobscured side lines depending on the observer viewing angle. And this torus, the structure of gas and dust, also explains the reprocessing of UV and optical emission into the infrared uh, by the dust that is present in this torus. And it also explains some other phenomena that are observed. For example, why um, that we cannot see broad lines at obscured side lines uh, because they are produced behind the torus. But when we look in polarized emission, which traces scattered radiation, we can see these broad line photons scattering in the torus and reaching us the observer. So this torus, uh, this, this large scale uh, circumnuclear material is very important for, um, for determining the, or setting the appearance of HN, but it could also be important for fueling the, the supermassive black hole. So the supermassive black hole accretes through an accretion disk, but one could assume that there is some kind of connection from the larger scale torus down to the accretion disk and that this torus provides a reservoir of gas and dust that could eventually be uh, accreted by the, by the supermassive black hole. Then finally, this um, well, um, torus could also provide us with a, with a probe on the AGN feedback. So AGN are very violent systems and they uh, insert energy and momentum into the uh, interstellar medium of a galaxy. And that is very important for galaxy formation and galaxy evolution. However, this happens on a, a very large scale, on large time uh, scales as well. And this torus, which is closer than the, than the interstellar medium, could provide like a, a closer look on this HN feedback that is so important for galaxy formation and galaxy evolution. So that is just setting the stage. I am interested in this torus. Um, however, um, recently uh, observations with the VLTI, with interferometric observations, 
Uh, they suggest that this um, circle nectar material is not so easy as just like a, a torus in the equatorial plane, but they see that there is also um, infrared emission, so coming from the dust that we assume is a torus, in the polar direction. So also in this direction compared to just this, this structure in the equatorial plane. And then we have another um, piece of information, that, um, so to say that complex relative transfer modeling claims that this structure is not smooth, it's not a simple uniform torus, but there will be clumps and filaments, and that is important for the radiation that comes out, and that is also a clue that we have that this, this torus, this circle nuclear material, is actually quite complex. So an interesting way to study this, this body of calcium dust, the, the torus, is to look at the um, X-ray features that uh, come out of this torus. So uh, at the start, the AGM is also a very bright source of X-ray emission. And these X-ray uh, photons, when they leave the AGM, they interact with this large body of gas and dust. And these interactions produce characteristic features that we can observe in the X-ray spectra of AGM. So uh, an idea could be, okay, let us use these features that are produced with, this in, with these interactions to study the torus in 3D, so the complex structure of the torus in 3D. Well, of course, if you want to use the features that were produced by uh, interactions to study the torus in 3D, we also need to model the interactions in 3D. So we have to model the X-ray interactions, so the absorption, the scattering, and the re-emission by the gas and dust uh, of X-rays in 3D. And that is what we can now do with SCIRT, the rate of transfer code SCIRT. So, um, very brief introduction on SCIRT. Uh, SCIRT is a, a Monte Carlo rate of transfer code that was developed and is actively maintained at Ghent University. Uh, it actually has a 20 years uh, development history, so it has a lot of features due to this long development. And originally, uh, we have always focused on, on rate of transfer in dust, so we were only looking at dust mainly first in galaxies, but then later also we were looking at the dust surrounding uh, AGM, so these stori. And now for my PhD, I have extended these skirt codes into the X-ray range. So that was for me personally to study uh, skirt AGM. However, the X-ray physics is quite general and could have nice applications in X-ray binaries and galaxies, supernova stars, and who knows more. So extending these skirt codes into the X-ray range, what, what does it mean? Well, it means that we have added the X-ray rate processes in free electron media, in cold gas, and in dust. So that is the important components that we assume are there in this, this torus or this complex distribution of circular nuclear material. And by extending these skirt codes into the X-ray range, uh, we immediately obtain an X-ray rated transfer code with all benefits of the skirt framework. So the, the skirt framework that has been developed for 20 years already. So that means that we can handle arbitrary geometries in, in full 3D, and now also in X-rays. That we have uh, advanced kinematics, so that means we, have, uh, we can model bulk velocities and velocity dispersions uh, at play in our rate of transfer modeling. And finally, as the skirt code has been used a lot for modeling the UV to infrared dust reprocessing, we can now make self-consistent model predictions from infrared all the way to X-ray energies with one code, with one model, and see what happens at this very broad wavelength range. So the X-ray rate of transfer processes, I spend most of the time on, on these things. This could be a bit technical, so I try to get to be a brief, uh, I'll let you know when this is over so you can pay attention again if you're not interested. But um, I'll try to be brief here. If you are, are interested in the details, uh, you can find uh, all the details uh, in the latest paper. And also please talk to me because I like to talk, to talk about this. So um, X-ray rate transfer in electrons. So what can happen when you have X-rays that travel through electrons? Only scattering. A single electron cannot absorb and a single electron cannot re-emit. The only thing that can happen is scattering. In the X-ray range, this is what we call compound scattering. And actually, this is quite a bit more complex than in the optical UV range, because at X-ray energy, so you have very high energy photons, your, um, is, you have to take care of the energy, or more precisely the four momentum conservation, which are collision between an X-ray photon and an electron. So that means when an X-ray photon 
collides, uh, scatters, uh, collides with an electron at rest, some of the energy of the photon will be transferred to the electron, uh, because your electron will scatter, also move away, so kinetic energy is transferred. And that means that when in X-rays you scatter on, on electrons, your X-ray photons will lose energy. So this is not happening in the, in the UV and in optical ranges. Their scattering is just elastic. It's just a change of direction. In the X-ray range, also your energy changes. So this is something important to, to, take, to take care of. Then uh, more strange stuff is happening there. Your cross-section, which is like the probability for scattering, takes off with increasing photon energies. And then if we look at the phase function, which is the distribution of how likely am I to scatter in any direction? We see that if the energy goes up, right, this is the, the purple line, for example, is the highest energy, then you're more and more likely to scatter forward, which makes sense. If you have like a very high energy photon, it's, it's not really willing to change its direction so much. So that was uh, electrons. Then the next thing that we have is uh, photo absorption or is rate of transferring cold gas. And then the first thing that we uh, that we consider is photoabsorption. Photoabsorption is basically ionization, but from the point of view from the from the photon. So usually when we talk about ionization, we're considering the atom, and it says okay, it loses electrons. But we are not really interested in the in the atom. We're not interested in the electrons. We're only interested in the photons. So that means what is an ionization for uh, for a photon? Well, the incoming X-ray energy is used to release an electron, but from the point of view of the X-ray photon, your X-ray photon just disappears. It is absorbed. So these uh, absorptions, uh, or these, these ionizations, they happen at the inner shell of electrons. So you have all the electron shells of, the, of your neutral uh, atom. These uh, absorption happen at the, at the inner shells because your high energy photon, uh, your X-ray photon, is so powerful that the outer shells do not interact very eff effectively, but the inner shells, who are bound very tightly, have very high binding energies, they in interact very efficiently. In SCIRT, we uh, model photoabsorption given a custom gas mix, so you can just construct your own gas mix, so much hydrogen, so much helium, whatever you want, completely custom, and then the total photoabsorption will be taken care of in your, in your simulation. Then finally, the last ingredient in, uh, in gas. So if this is not nice, it's almost over. And the last ingredient that we have in the gas is scattering. So X-rays scattering on the gas. What is this really? Well, your gas has a lot of bound electrons. And what really happens is that your X-ray photon scatters on the electrons that are bound to the neutral gas atoms. So a neutral gas atom has a lot of electrons. And your X-rays, they scatter on these electrons that are bound to the neutral gas atoms. There is two different regimes. So we have an, an elastic regime and an inelastic regime. So we mean your photon conserves its energy or your photon loses energy. The elastic, the elastic case is called radius scattering. It's in yellow, so it's most important at low energies. Your inelastic process, your inelastic channel is bound quantum scattering. It is most important at the higher energies. And also each of them have, have, has each of them have their own phase function, so the probability for being directed in a certain direction. So you see the Rayleigh scattering is mainly forward, while the um, bound cotton scattering is fully uh, suppressed here in the forward direction. This has to do, again, with the conservation of forward momentum uh, for your collision. So this was the gas. Then finally, we also uh, introduced a dust model, an X-ray dust model to skirt. Of course, we were almost... Uh, it was almost mandatory to do this because of our strong history with dust rate transfer and skirt. So we could not extend the, the skirt module without taking proper, proper care of the, of the dust. So we have a, a module that uh, treats absorption and scattering by dust. So here you can see the cross-section and the probability for interactions between um, 0 0.1 and 10 kiloelectron volts. This is basically very similar to interacting with the gas, but with some nice modulations around the uh, atomic absorption edges. So very brief uh, memo on the, the SCIRT X-ray dust model that is now uh, implemented in SCIRT. It's a very basic, like if you're doing UV to infrared modeling, this is a very basic dust model. However, it is very like it's advanced enough in the X-ray range. So it's a uh, mix of olivine and graphene particles 
We have optical properties by drain and a size distribution by wine garden. And that makes now that we have this one single dust mix that we can use in skirt from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the four micrometers. So we cover four orders of magnitude in wavelengths with this one single dust mix, which I think is nice. So uh, as I told before, these, uh, this dust produces these nice wiggles around. So in the cross section, these nice, nice wiggles around the atomic absorption edges. So this is uh, interference in your solid dust grains. Um, and these are also included in the, in the dust model that is now in skirt. Then the very final uh, ingredient is that we also model scattering on dust grains. However, this is quite complex in the, in the X-ray range because your scattering is extremely formed. So that is already happening if you're scattering in the, in the UV, for example. The higher your energy, the more you will scatter forward. Again, the same story. Your energy has a lot of energy. Uh, your your X-ray photon has a lot of energy and it's not really willing to change direction. So this is the phase function for dust scattering in the uh, X-ray range. So you can see it's just like a, a straight line, but if you really zoom in, it's not exactly a straight line, but it looks very straight. So you could say, okay, let's just ignore the scattering. Well, scattering forward is just doing nothing, right? But however, eh, here on the right hand side, you can see that not even this small angle scattering is something that is observed. Like it is not 100% forward. It looks like very forward. It is not completely forward. And it produces these nice dust scattering halos. So we wanted to be able to, to model these dust scattering halos with skirt. So we had to implement this phase function. Actually, uh, this is quite complex in like a very technical aspect. We had to update our photon detection scheme to be able to model such a forward phase function, but eventually it worked. And now we can model the absorption and the scattering uh, for dust screens. So can I, can I, can I, yes. So what, what exactly is the, are those two figures? So this is an observation of dust scattering halo. This is a dust scattering halo that is um, modeled with skirt. This is a simulation of a dust scattering halo with skirt. That's a single dust ring or? No, this is um, a point source. So you can think like an, an, an X-ray binary um, that produces X-rays. And around it, there is some diffuse dust. And on your diffuse dust, your X-ray photons are, are scattered. So there's only like a point source in here. So the, the fact that we see extended emission has to do with the fact that there is dust that scatters these photons around. This is mainly an illustration that although the scattering is extremely forward, it is not 100% forward. Because then we would only see one point in the forward direction. But in, sorry, but in the right is the, the tracks is because of material in the line. Yes, the indeed. So, indeed. So this is like a, a real observation and it looks like the dust is like ejected in the shells. While here, this is just like a brief illustration that we can model the scattering halos. We, we have not tried to model this thing. So we have no shells of dust around it. It's just diffused dust uh, distributed in the form. Yeah. I have a question about yep. uh, the fact that you're using graphite there. Is there a reason you're picking graphite over amorphous carbon? Um, I guess this is probably the only like X-ray um, like the only dust composition for which there exists, um, like cross section, like optical properties all over the whole range. So there has been like a lot of nice work um, in, in Amsterdam for the group of Elisa Costantini, but they only focus on like these nice features, but only on these nice features. So they do not cover the full continuous wavelength range. And we want to have a model, of course, that, well, we do not only want to have an SED that works around these edges, but we want to have like a a broadband SED, and that's why we do this because currently this is the only thing that is available. Yes. Isn't the one that the thing based on extinction studies of the How representative is that of particular sources like that or not I don't know. I mean, probably, probably not so much. I, I don't know. Uh, it should. So the the main thing here that's like the dust in in, in X rays is really like a higher order. Um, effects, so, so it's not all dominating like it is in the UV infrared. Your main interactions in X-rays happen with your atoms. And first order, it doesn't even matter if it's neutral gas or if it's dust. It will like broadband if you have a low enough resolution, and low I mean even like with, with, with X-ray Newton, you will not see a real difference between just neutral gas or complete dust. 
only if you have like very high resolution uh, spectroscopy, you can see that around these edges, you see these wiggles that are caused by the interference by the dust. And I guess even if it's like a very rudimentary uh, dust model, given the current like observatories, this is quite good. Um, but like the set size distribution itself is maybe not the real one. So I'm sorry, related question. Um, so since you, in principle, if you had good spectra, then you could in some way at least tell the uh, what fraction of the dust is carbon rich yes. versus oxygen. Yes, yes, yes. But for how many sources, uh, how many systems do you have that sort of tight constraint? Well, so now it's not so much like with Chandra, we can we can actually do like some of these some of these uh, like studies of the of the edges and. There have been studies also done by like the group of Isa Costantini in Leiden, also Lia Corrales in uh, Michigan, um, who have like fitted like a, a more complex dust model with different composition to observations of these edges, and that works, I think, 30 sources. However, there is well new X-ray images coming up with more uh, sensitivity, much higher uh, energy resolution, and with these new systems, hopefully we'll be able to do these kind of studies in more systems. Okay, so the radiation physics is over now. <laughs> Let's go. I know the last one. Uh, you changed. Okay. Ah. Uh, are you including or is there a way of including uh, inverse quantum from lower energy photons? Or? Yes, yes, yes. So, um, yeah, it's it's yes. Like the answer is yes. Uh, but <laughs> the implementation um, in our implementation, like inverse quantum scattering, does not exist because every time we do an interaction, we always like go to the uh, rest stream of the electron. It's just like technical stuff. So we always can do the normal content scattering. However, if you then transform back to the observer frame, you have inverse content scattering. So this is like fully complete content and inverse content scattering. However, for our implementation, we didn't need to consider because it was implied by like the reference frame shifts that we do uh, every time. Okay, so no way to go back. And um, so we implemented these, uh, these like uh, these one-on-one, -on -one, so one atom and one X-ray photon interactions. But then we wanted to see them like in a in a more like a more three D uh, environment. So we tested our codes against some popular uh, torus models. So we're back to the to the tori. So we have a, a central source of X-ray emission, which is the X-ray corona of an AGM. Then around it, we have a torus, a donut shaped geometry of well, in the first order, only gas. These are popular models that are around, and we compare the skirt implementation, which is in black, with um, some popular models in yellow. So here you can see a comparison between skirt and MyTorus. MyTorus is one of the first models that was out there that could be used for observational data fitting. And indeed, uh, we see a very nice match between skirt and MyTorus. The only difference being that, well, there is a lot of lines that were actually not implemented in MyTorus, but they are included in skirt. One more uh, recent model and uh, like very um, similar in, in terms of the physics that is actually implemented. Uh, they also implement bound electron scattering, which, for example, was not done uh, with my torus, is Reflex uh, by Baltani and Ricci. Um, and again, the same thing, uh, the match looks very similar. So, as an illustration, uh, so this was like the, the benchmarking part, as an illustration of what we can now do with SCIRT, uh, we um, made some nice 3D clumpy torus models. So on the right hand side, you can see a smooth torus. Then in the middle uh, part, you can see a two phase torus where we have concentrated 50% of the material in the exact same geometry, and then 50% of the material in random plums spread around the geometry. And already from the images, you can see some nice things. So the resolution here is not so nice, but if you look very carefully, you can see like this nice shadow lane. So these clumps, they act as very dense scattering sites, and the photons can pass like in the interplant medium, but not really through the clumps. And then on the right hand side, you see like a clumpy torus where all the material is concentrated in clumps. This is nice to look at. Of course, uh, more uh, important are the, the spectra. And what can we see? For example, if we increase and the, the clump fraction, so this is the red line is the completely smooth model. And if we uh, increase it, to more and more plums, then we see that also our spectra go up. And this means that if you have a more clumpy medium or more clumpy torus, then some of your soft X-ray photons that would usually be fully absorbed by the uniform uh, material 
are now allowed to scatter on the clumps and then escape through the interplumb medium. So this is like a, a really nice trend that soft X-ray energies, the more clumpy your medium is, the more likely your soft X-ray potents are able to escape from the torus. Of course, this is a very obvious result, but uh, if you have a clumpy torus, then of course you break your azimuthal symmetry. If you look around your torus, then depending if you're looking through a clump or looking past the clump, your spectra can be very different. So this is something to take in mind. If you only have, for example, an inclination angle as parameter, once you go to 3D, well, this inclination parameter alone is not enough. If you look around, it will be like spectra can be very different for different azimuthal angles. So many um, X-ray rate of transfer code exists already, but what we can really do now with SCIRT is doing the rate of transfer in full 3D. And with full 3D, we mean not like a, a torus that has actual sim symmetries, but really uh, systems that have no symmetries at all, that are truly 3D. So here we can see, for example, um, a hydrodynamic simulation of a torus by uh, WADA and collaborators. And this is a hydrodynamic simulation, so it has no symmetries. And as an application of the 3D uh, functionalities of SCIRT, we have taken this as our input model, our distribution of gas, uh, electrons, and dust. And we have post processes, meaning we have sent X ray photons through these geometries to see what it would look like in X rays. So here we have an, an, an X ray image. So you can see the different colors uh, are so in red, we have the soft X ray emission. And then if we go to green and blue, we have the harder X ray emission. So one thing that we see, for example, is we have like this dark lane in the equatorial plane. And of course, that is where our material is very dense and we cannot have any X-ray photons passing. So if we look at the uh, covering factor, so you can interpret the, the left-hand figure as an optical depth map, uh, all sky as seen from the center. And the white regions have optical depths more than uh, five. So they are definitely not um, penetratable. So that means that if you look at the two figures who are made at different photon energies, that the covering factor, so the region where no photons can escape, decreases with energy. Well, of course, that is what we expect, because here we have the very uh, dense material that is not, um, like, photons cannot pass there. It doesn't matter if they're high energy or low energy. However, in this direction, we have the, well, less dense material, and the soft X-ray photons are absorbed and the hard X-ray photons are not absorbed. That is why the hard X-ray photons can pass and the soft X-ray photons cannot pass. Something else that we see is like the nice uh, polar extension of this, uh, of this material. That is because there is like very little thin gas in this polar direction. And that is the only way where the uh, soft X-ray photons can, can reach us because all soft X-ray photons that uh, escape in this direction or this direction will be fully absorbed. Only photons that travel in this direction, where there's barely any gas, can be scattered towards us in the, in the polar direction. And that is the red um, well, polar extension that we see here. Of course, X-ray images are very nice to look at, but the scales of these things are well, not resol resolvable with, with, with observation. So it's not so useful and more important is looking at the spectra. So if we look at the, the, the X-ray spectra that come out of skirt, for different inclinations, well, we see these, uh, these nice spectra with all kinds of features that are related to this uh, circumductory material. We see the absorption edges, uh, for example, here. We see the uh, nice uh, fluorescent lines that appear. And if we zoom in on the iron K alpha region, we see that the iron K alpha line is actually two different lines, uh, K alpha two and K alpha one line. But uh, I think the nicest feature is this uh, iron K alpha Compton shoulder that appears at the low energy side of the iron. And we can use these kind of, of simulations as a model to make predictions for real observatories. So we have uh, PRISM, a very nice new mission that is, will be launched Saturday evening. Um, and it will have like a, a very high, nice energy resolution. I think like an order of magnitude better than current, um, than current uh, observatories that are out there. So we can see, okay, what would such an AGN look like with CRISM, so we can involve the uh, spectra that we that came out of our hydrodynamic simulation with the uh, CRISM response, and we get something like this. So if we rebin this a bit, then we can see indeed that with CRISM we will be able to see the two different uh, iron K alpha lines. But I think more important, 
we will we will even be able to see this nice quantum shoulder at the low energy side of the iron K alpha line. So that means that given the geometry from the hydrodynamic simulation, we can also play with some with some things. So we can um, we can include or exclude the effect of kinematics. We can um, assume that the electrons are bound or free. Um, we can play with the amount of dusts, and all these ways we can make predictions for uh, prism or predictions for real X-ray observed. And then, as a takeaway message, I want you to know that uh, X-ray rated transfer with skirt is now possible. Um, the code is publicly available and well well documented online on the skirt website. Uh, we implement like a complete set of X-ray physics for modeling the circular material, so gold neutral material. Eh? We do not model highly ionized species or, or something. We have support for, well, arbitrary 3D geometries with no constraints, I would say. And we also model uh, advanced kinematics. And then finally, as the uh, code has been around a long time already for modeling the UV to infrared uh, spectra, we can now make self-consistent model predictions within one code, one single model from the infrared all the way to X-ray wavelengths. Okay, thank you a lot.